So I'm going to fill in just a little bit about what got cut off there at the end. This next Sunday, whether you know it or not, is Easter Sunday. You guys excited for Easter? This is my, by far, favorite time of the year. I love Holy Week. And so this week, I encourage you to be checking out Facebook because we're going to be doing some teachings every day of the week, just kind of going along with what Jesus was doing in his final week. But next Friday night, we do have our Good Friday service. It's going to be a lot of fun. And then Saturday is going to be our outreach. So if you're going to be a volunteer, we had 50 people sign up to volunteer. Give yourselves a hand for that. That's incredible. Um, We're going to have your shirts ready for you that morning. And uh, then if you can be here at 10 o'clock, we will get you assigned to where you're going to be. We're going to have inflatables, free food, all kinds of fun stuff going on, some giveaways. But the reason that we are doing Saturday is twofold. The first reason is we want to show the love of Jesus to our community, right? We are called to make God known. And one of the ways that we do that is through these fun outreaches. Because people come here and we have an opportunity to love on them, to meet them, and just to show them who Jesus is. But the second part is that our hope is that if they come here on Saturday, they will come back for Sunday. Amen? Amen. Because on Sunday morning, we have an opportunity to share the gospel. And as far as our country is actually moving away from the things of Jesus, Easter is still one of those days where a lot of people will go to church. It's just something that they've done as a family. It's part of a tradition. And so I really want to encourage you this week to invite people next Sunday. Invite them. Talk to your friends, your family members, maybe a coworker, even a neighbor. And on your seats this morning, there are postcard invitations. And I encourage you to take those with you. Now, if you want more than what you have just on your seat, you can see there are some empty chairs around. So feel free to take as many extras as you want off the seats around you. And I just really want to challenge you this week. Put that postcard in the hands of some one, okay? And invite them to come with you to church. Because this is the week where you can invite anybody to church and they won't think that you're weird. They won't think that you're strange. You don't have to worry about it because people expect to go to church on Easter. Next Sunday, we are doing a special message called Scars, Evidence of Victory. And I'm just believing that through this gospel presentation, we are going to see the front of this whole building filled with people giving their lives to Jesus. Can you believe with me for that? Awesome. Well, today is Palm Sunday, so at the end of our service, the kids are going to come down and we're going to have a special celebration of Palm Sunday with them. But before we do that, we're going to get into God's Word. You guys ready to dive in? Awesome. Well, I had a video to get us started, but I have a feeling that that's not going to work. So we're not going to watch that this morning. Technical difficulties, right? But the thing that I've learned after 20 years of doing this is if you have a technical difficulty, the best thing to do is just act like nothing went wrong and then nobody really cares. So we're going to just dive straight into the word this morning. Uh, We're going to be looking at Luke chapter 5, if you have your Bible, Luke chapter 5. Now, I'm going to tell you right from the beginning, we have a lot of scripture that we're going to be covering. If you're new here at Word of Life, you're going to find that we're not one of those one or two verses on a Sunday churches, are we guys? No, we do a lot of scripture because we believe that God's word is what you need more than what you need from what I have to say. So we're going to cover a lot of scripture today. We're going to finish up our current series, Change Brings Challenge. The challenge that we're going to talk about today, in my opinion, is the most important and difficult challenge that anyone faces. You want to know what it is? It's failure. So many times people run from failure. They allow failure to stall them out, to paralyze them. They allow failure to convince them that they're not worthy of love, that they're not worthy of God's goodness, that they're not worthy of a future. But that is not true. And today we're going to look at one of the biggest failures, in quotes, in the Bible, the Apostle Peter. Because after this morning, after you read about all of Peter's mistakes, you're going to go, you know, I'm really not that bad. And you're going to realize that God can use your life in incredible ways. You guys ready to get started? Here we go. Healthy things grow. In Luke chapter 5, verses 4 through 8, it says, When Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, also known as Peter, Now, go out to where the water is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we have worked hard all night and we didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, 
I'll let the nets down again. By the way, that's always the right attitude with Jesus or the Bible. You may not like it. It may not be how you're feeling. It may not even be what you've been told before. But if Jesus says it, you should go ahead and do it. Do you agree? So they let down their nets and they were so full of fish, they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat, and soon both boats were so full of fish that they were on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell on his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. One of my favorite stories in the Gospels, because here you have this group of fishermen who know their business, and then this carpenter-turned-rabbi tells them how they should fish. Now, they've been out all night doing their thing, working hard, and they haven't had any luck. Nothing good has happened for them all night. They're worn out. They just want to go back. They want to go rest. And Jesus says, no, I want you to try one more time. Now, if Jesus tells you to try one more time, do you think you should try one more time? Too many of us give up because we think of ourselves as, well, it didn't work, so obviously it's not going to work next time. But if Jesus tells you to keep trying, you keep trying. And look what happens to Peter. Peter has this moment of realization where he says, oh my goodness, there's something different about him. Healthy things grow. But as we learned last week, it's often right on the heels of a great victory that we have a failure. Let's look at Matthew chapter 14, verse 28. It says, then Peter called to him, Jesus, Lord, if that's really you, will you tell me to come out to you walking on the water? Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and he walked on the water toward Jesus. Now, the reason that this story is so important to me is because of what it shows us about faith. You see, Peter saw Jesus doing something, and he said, I want to do that too. Did you know that you can do everything that Jesus did in the Bible? Every single thing. The same Holy Spirit that anointed him at his baptism is the same Holy Spirit that will come upon you if you ask God to empower your life. Peter got out of the boat and he started walking on water. We often forget about this because of what happens next. But Peter did this. He actually walked on the water. This is a huge victory, right? This is a win. Have you ever walked on water? I water skied once, lost my ski and took about six steps and then smashed my face into the water. That was the closest I've ever been. Six steps, right? That's as good as it got for me. But Peter actually did the thing that he set out to do. But... When he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and he began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? Why did you doubt me? See, this is where failure actually begins. When we get our eyes off of Jesus and onto everything else. That's when doubt begins to rise. When our eyes are on Jesus, our faith is incredible and we can do anything. We can get out of a boat in the middle of a storm and walk on the waves despite what's going on around us. But when we take our eyes off of Jesus and get him onto everything else, our circumstances, the situation, the people around us, that's when we begin to sink. Growing things change. So Peter's going through a process here. And by the way, I want you to understand, victory is always a process. Winning takes time. Now, we're we're a microwave culture. We want it done right now. We just want to be fixed. We want all of our problems solved. We want to be who we're supposed to be right this minute. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. It's going to take you the rest of your life until the moment you stop breathing to be who Jesus wants you to be. The decision that you make is whether or not you're going to keep progressing forward or if you're going to stall out and just stay stuck where you're at right now. In Matthew 16, it says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples a very important question. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Peter answered, well, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. 
And Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any other human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. And all the powers of hell will not conquer it. See, now change is occurring. Peter has this healthy understanding of Jesus. By the way, is he faultless? Absolutely not. Is he perfect? Not a chance. But he's learning and he's growing. And as he's growing, he's changing. Jesus has just changed something very profound in Peter's life. He's made him a promise that will follow him to the end of his days. He says, Peter, I'm going to use you and I'm going to use your testimony because Peter had this natural inclination. He did not have a problem with opening his mouth. Some of you have that same gift. Some of you guys will share your opinion with anybody, whether it's right or not, and you'll do it with gusto, right? You're going to double down no matter what because you're stubborn and you are right. And you know what? Jesus can use that. Peter often, set, often opened his mouth and stuck his foot all the way down his throat, but God used that personality. He used that willingness to get out there and keep trying for his glory. And he said, I'm going to use that testimony. And I'm going to build my church on that testimony. And you're going to be a pivotal part of this. And I'm going to use you. And even the gates of hell will not have victory over the plans I have over your life. Now, I want you to notice something. God did not say, unless you screw up. Unless you make a mistake. He said, no, my plan is to use you. And by the way, God's plan is to use your life. God's plan is to use you where you work where you live, amongst the people that you associate. God's plan is to bless your life and to use your story, your testimony of what he has done for you to draw all kinds of people to him. And he'll do it despite your mistakes, despite your faults. But you have to get over being a failure. Because failing is all about a mindset. Healthy things grow. Growing things change, but change brings challenge. In Matthew chapter 16, right after this amazing victory, where Peter gets called out in front of all the rest of the disciples and gets told, I'm going to build my church on your story, and you're going to be at the center of it. It says, from then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed. But on the third day, he would be raised from the dead. But, there's that but again, Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said. This will never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not God's. You know where, you know where failure comes from? Failure comes from seeing things from a human point of view and not from God's. It's how we understand failure. So Peter had just been called out for a very good thing. Now he gets called out publicly for a very bad thing. He gets called Satan. Now I've jokingly called people Satan before. Maybe my children, it depends on the day. But can you imagine Jesus calling you Satan? Like that's a bad moment. I don't know who, who you are. Like you don't recover easy from that. Because no matter what you do for the rest of your life, they're like, hey, here comes Satan. Get behind me, Satan. You're a dangerous trap to me. What's the dangerous trap? Well, the dangerous trap is that Jesus was telling them something for their own good. And you know what they were saying? Nope, nope, I don't receive that. I won't accept that. I'm going to tell you something right now. You live in a fallen and broken world. Bad things are going to happen. You are a fallen and broken person. Made righteous by the blood of Jesus, you are still going to sin. You're still going to make mistakes. You're going to screw up really big sometimes. 
Now, if you want to be super spiritual, you can say, I don't receive that in the name of Jesus. I'm not going to accept that negative testimony. That's, we screw God's word up really bad. Have you ever noticed that? That we take God's word out of context? Here, Jesus is telling them these things to prepare them. And sometimes God's going to get very real with us. And he's going to tell us things that we don't like to hear. And if all we ever do is rebuke God for trying to warn us and prepare us, we're going to get taken at unawares. And those type of people that live in that confused state of faith walk around frustrated and angry at God saying, well, where was God? He was there all along. He warned you that it was coming, but you rebuked it because you didn't like what you were hearing. Not everything's butterflies and rainbows. I wish that it was. Here's the thing though. Jesus does allow bad things to happen, but he will bring you through every bad thing that happens one way or the other. That's the power of God. You are only seeing things from a human point of view. What things in your life are you seeing incorrectly because you're looking at it from your perspective and you're not stepping back and allowing God to show you his perspective? In Luke chapter 22, verse 31, Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan himself has asked to sift each of you like wheat. But I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. I want you to see something here. He said, I have prayed that your faith would not fail. The next thing he says is when you have repented. So what is he telling him? You're going to screw up. You're about to make a really big mistake. But he just said, I'm praying that your faith does not fail. So does making mistakes mean that you don't have faith? No. Stop believing the lie. Stop believing that you don't love Jesus. Stop believing that you're never going to become more like Jesus. Stop believing that you can't do the things of Jesus because you've made mistakes or because you still have a personality flaw right now. Because Jesus says, I'm praying that your faith will not fail after you make the mistake. The evidence of your faith is not quitting. Did you hear me? The evidence of your faith is not giving up, not being perfect. So from now moving forward through the rest of this message, I want to show you some ways how to see differently. Because the problem comes when we see things from a human perspective and not God's perspective. The problem becomes when we don't understand that true faith, that true victory is moving forward despite our failures, despite our mistakes, trying to get better and repenting. Because what does repent mean? Repentance means to change. Healthy things grow. Growing things do what? They change. They repent. They recognize their failures. They recognize their issues. They don't just feel sorry for themselves and quit. No, they move forward and they take action. In Matthew 26, 31 through 35, it says, So when they were on the way, Jesus said to them, Tonight you will all desert me. You guys getting the feel you're like this feeling this wasn't like a fun evening out with Jesus, right? I mean, he's like, hey, Satan. And then the next thing, he's like, hey, guys, man, it's going to be a good night. You all are going to abandon me and act like you don't even know me. And I, the Peter and the guys are just like, what? Like, who made him mad? Like, who gave him the wrong side of the donkey? Like, I don't understand what's going on. For the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. See, one of the biggest reasons that we do fail is because we get focused on the wrong things. All they were hearing was that Jesus was going to die. That's all Peter heard. He heard Peter say, I'm going to die. And Peter said, no, that can't happen. But what he also said to them, I'm going to rise from the dead. Which is actually, if you think about it, a bigger victory. I mean, what's more impressive, staying alive or coming back from the dead? Because all of us are staying alive in the moment. Like, I know some pretty dumb people that manage to stay alive. I have no idea how, but they manage it, right? But coming back from the dead, that's impressive. But they don't hear that because they're looking at it from the wrong perspective. Jesus says, I will go ahead of you into Galilee and I'll meet you there. And here comes Peter. 
open his mouth. Even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter. This very night before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you even know me. No, Peter insisted. Even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the disciples vowed the same thing. One of the things that you can do to see differently is you have to be willing to have your vision corrected. How many of y'all wear glasses in here or contacts? Thank God up to this point I haven't. I've been told that as I get older, there's a chance that I might have to. I'm not looking forward to that day. Um, I thought I needed glasses a few years ago. I bought some and I kept walking off of things. I just, my, I was just messed up by that. The thought of putting something on my eyeball, couldn't do it, would throw up. So that's not an option. So just praying that God preserves my eyes. But you know, how dumb would it be to have the opportunity to have your vision corrected and walk around half blind? And yet a lot of us do exactly that. Or Jesus is trying to offer us correction. He's trying to show us something, to tell us something. And we're going, nope, 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 nope. Won't do it, won't do it, won't do it, won't hear it, won't hear it, won't hear it. And Jesus is like, no, if you would just listen, I could help keep you out of dumb situations. But we're not correctable. And Matthew 26, verse 40, it said, Then Jesus returned to his disciples. This is while he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying. And he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, it's always Peter. You guys see this? Couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give into temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body, the flesh, it's weak. We've been talking about this throughout this whole series. Your, fle- your spirit, the fully, completely saved part of you, Wow, I just really spit. I don't know if you saw that. Apologize for that. The fully saved part of you, it's completely saved, washed in the blood of Jesus. The rest of you, your soul and your body, it's a work in progress. But that's okay. You don't have to be perfect to have faith. You just have to be willing to keep moving and changing. So one of the other things that you need to do in order to see is you got to keep your eyes open. These guys were worn out and they, all they could do was just sit back and close their eyes and they weren't seeing anything. If you want to move forward with Jesus, you have to keep your eyes open to what he's trying to show you. In John 18, verse 10, Peter, this is after Judas Iscariot shows up with, with all the guards with him and they've come to arrest Jesus. And in the midst of all this chaos and confusion, it says, Peter, by the way, have you noticed who it is again? It's Peter drew a sword and slashed off the right ear of Malchus, the high priest slave. But Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back in its sheath. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering the Father has given me? See, Jesus had already warned Peter, I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to die. And what was Peter's response? Uh Uh-uh. Nope, not going to happen. Then Peter says, this very night, you are all going to abandon me. And Peter goes, "Uh uh-uh, I'm going to cut somebody's ear off. I'll show you. And this can be our attitude where our pride wells up and we just do the first stupid thing that comes into our mind. Some of you are like, I've never done that. You're lying. You're lying. And you know how I'm lying? Because all of us have ended up in bad situations or bad relationships or out of the will of God because in our defiance and trying to maintain this level of credibility with ourselves and not wanting to admit our need to change before God, we try to do things in our own strength according to our own understanding. So we just grab our sword and we just start swinging that bad boy. And Jesus goes, Peter, put it away. I've told you this is going to happen, but I'm going to rise again. Yes, there's going to be painful moments in life, but there is ultimately victory. So if we want to see correctly, we have to get the junk out of our eyes. Peter needed to put away his sword. Because at this moment, all it was was debris. All it was was clouding his vision from seeing what God really wanted to accomplish. 
In Matthew 26, verse 69, guess who again? Peter. Meanwhile, this is after Jesus has been arrested. Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came over and said to Peter, you were one of those with Jesus the Galilean. But Peter denied it in front of everybody. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Later, out by the gate, another servant girl noticed him and said to those standing around, well, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, Peter denied it, this time with an oath. I don't even know the guy, he said. A little later, I'm sorry, a little later, some of the other bystanders came over to Peter and said, you must be one of them. We can tell that you're a Galilean by your accent. And Peter swore a curse on me if I'm lying. I don't know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. You see, one of the reasons why we often fail to see from God's perspective is we're too worried about what everyone else is looking at. See, they were looking at him and they understood who he was. And Peter became fearful. 20 minutes ago, he was chopping people's ears off with a sword. And now he's scared of little servant girls knowing who he is. Because he got too caught up in what everyone else was thinking and what everyone else was saying. And it got his perspective skewed. Some of you this morning have really got to shut off your TV. Right? And, and hear me on this next one. This one's going to hurt some of you bad. Like you might bleed a little. Are you ready? Just because it's on YouTube doesn't mean it's real. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Some of you all's ears are bleeding right now. I can just see the pain and anguish in your face. Just because somebody says it on YouTube and they have a really good video. By the way, give Brian or Sean an hour and a half and they can create really good graphics to make you believe anything on YouTube, right? Because we're just like, well, if it's good quality, it's got to be true. That's not, that's not right. Just because the talking heads on your favorite um, commentary channel, whether it be politics or whatever it else is that you're listening to, just because they're saying it doesn't mean it's right. And I'm even going to say this, just because another believer says it, doesn't mean it's true. The only thing that matters is what lines up with the Word of God and what the Holy Spirit confirms in our spirits. Don't be concerned about what everyone else is saying. And by the way, if you're a Christian, they're going to start saying some really nasty things about you. Make sure they're saying nasty things about you because of the love and the truth that you, that you believe in and not because of the way you're living. Failure is not the absence of mistakes. It is the unwillingness to keep trying. Failure is not the ab, the ab, I'm sorry. Failure is not the presence of mistakes. I said that wrong. Some of you guys are like, that makes no sense. A lot of what I say makes no sense. You have to figure it out on your own. It's kind of like a game. <laughs> Failure is not the presence of mistakes. But victory is the unwillingness to keep trying. Does that make sense? So you're not a failure just because you screw up once in a while. You're human. That goes with the territory. You only become a failure if you decide, I'm not going to keep trying. And you can come to that conclusion for all kinds of reasons. Because sometimes we just think back on all the dumb stuff we've done and we just allow it to heap up on top of us and it becomes our identity and we get covered with shame and we get covered with regret and we get covered with sorrow and we just get to the place where we can't even take another step because we're so weighed down by our past. You know what I love about Peter? He's got like a four second memory. Like Jesus calls him Satan and the next word out of his mouth is, oh Jesus, I'm with you. Jesus says, put your sword away. And the next minute, he's denying Christ. But you know what? When he denied Jesus, that one got to him. The rooster crowed. And if you've ever seen the passion of the Christ, they do a really cool job of this. I don't know if this happened or not, but you know what? I think Mel Gibson may have got this one right. The moment the rooster crowed, Jesus, with blood coming down his face, looks over and Peter makes eye contact. 
and it just crushes him. Sometimes God's going to allow you to get crushed because he's trying to make a point. Sometimes the only way to get our attention off of ourselves is for us to feel a little bit of uncomfort, discomfort, a little bit of pain. I don't like that, but it's just reality of who we are as people. So Peter gets crushed in a moment, but it has the right result. Because Peter goes out and he weeps before God and he repents before God, but he does not allow it to make him quit. Just because God points out your failure does not mean that God is indicting you as a failure. He's not putting a label on you. In fact, he's trying to avoid the label from attaching to you. He's saying, stop doing this or this is who you will become. But if you'll stop doing this, then you can become like me. In Mark chapter 16, verse 7, this is after Jesus has risen from the dead and the two women have gone to the tomb. The angel speaks and says, now go tell his disciples and who? And who? Come on, guys. And who? Go tell my disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you before he died. Why does Peter get included here? Because Peter screwed up. Peter messed up. And so the way that our screwed up, twisted brains work, because Satan is the accuser, and for some reason we love to listen to him, these women show back up, and Jesus knows that if these women showed up and simply said, hey, this angel just told me to tell you disciples to go meet Jesus in Galilee, that Peter would go, well, obviously that doesn't mean me. Because I screwed up too big. I denied him. There's no coming back from that. I deny Jesus. He, he could never forgive me. He could never use me again. So no, Jesus takes away that opportunity and says, go tell my disciples, including Peter. Make sure Peter knows, hey, dummy, you're included in this. I love you. You go too, because you still belong to me. You are still mine. In Luke 24, verse 10, it says, it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to the rest of the men, so they didn't believe it. However, who? Peter, Peter jumps up and he runs to the tomb to look. Stooping, he peers in, he sees the empty linen wrappings, and then he goes home again wondering what has occurred. This is why Jesus continued to trust Peter. Even after Peter has screwed up in every way imaginable, Peter has, has gotten his sword out. Peter has been called Satan. Peter has denied knowing Jesus. But yet, when the women come and say, hey, Jesus isn't there. We've been told he's risen from the dead. Peter goes, okay, I'm going. And he takes off running. Everybody else goes, oh, nah, that couldn't be. But Peter, Peter has the faith. Peter believes because there's something about Peter that refuses to give up and to quit. We all need to be like Peter. We all need to be able to look in the mirror every morning and say, yeah, yesterday, woo -hoo -hoo, I blew it. It's a new day. What do you have for me today, Lord? What do you have for me today, Lord? Don't stop looking. Peter never stopped looking. He never stopped looking for what Jesus wanted to show him. Then a little bit later in John 21, verse 3, Simon Peter said to the guys, hey, I'm going fishing. And they said, hey, we'll come too. So they all went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. So he called out to them, hey, fellas, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then he said, well, throw out your net on the right side of the boat and you'll get some. So they did. And they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. Then the disciple Jesus loved, John, says to Peter, it's the Lord. When Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, jumped into the water, and he headed for shore. Why does Jesus trust Peter? 
Because Peter is teachable. Peter is correctable. Peter is willing to change. And even when challenge comes, even when mistakes happen, Peter refuses to quit and to give in. Peter refuses the label of failure. And he says, I'm going to keep striving for Jesus. And when he sees Jesus is near, he doesn't care what anybody else thinks. He dives out of the boat and he swims because he's getting to Jesus before anybody else. This is why Peter has victory. Because he doesn't listen to the world around him. Last story. John chapter 21, verse 15. After breakfast, Jesus called Simon Peter over and he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know that I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Then Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know that I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time, Jesus asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now, Peter was hurt that Jesus asked him this question a third time. And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Three times, he asked Peter the same question. Sometimes, the reason that we aren't seeing things from God's perspective is because we need to focus. Jesus was getting Peter's focus where it was supposed to be. Do you love me? Yes then do my work. Peter, do you love me? Yes, then do my work. Peter, Peter, hey, Peter, yes. Do you love me? Yes, then do my work. Jesus is asking you the same question this morning. Do you love me? I'm not asking you, are you perfect? I'm not asking you, are you mistake free? I'm not asking you if you'll never do anything stupid again. I'm asking you, do you love me? Then do you do what I've called you to do and allow me to change you and to correct you and to help focus you when you make the mistakes. But don't quit because you're afraid of the mistakes. Failure is not an option because it won't happen if you refuse to give up. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, there's some folks in here this morning that have given up. They have quit because they believe that they are failures. There's people in this room right now who have a chronic issue that will not let go. And because of that, they've bought into the lie that that is simply who they are now. And it is a lie from Satan himself. Other people are constantly reminded about something they've done years ago and it plagues them. And every time they try to take a step forward, Satan reminds them of that. And other people are in here are so worried about what everyone else thinks that they will not trust you for themselves. Jesus, help us to be like Peter who despite his many flaws and his repeated mistakes was still willing to get up and try every single time. Help us, Lord, to see from your perspective and not our own. In Jesus' name. I want to invite you this morning to stand to your feet. Our prayer team is going to make their way down here to the front. If you need prayer for anything at all, please come and let us pray with you this morning.
that the highest king would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love a child of God. Yes, I am. Amen. Are you guys ready to celebrate this morning with our kids? All right, here we go. Hosanna to the son of David.
on, church. Say it with them. Hosanna to the Son of David. 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 Can we give our kids a big hand this morning? So on this day, almost 2,000 years ago, Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem for the final time. And he came as a king, but not the kind of king that most of the people were expecting. He came as a king of peace and as a savior, full of grace and mercy and love. He came riding on a donkey, which was a symbol of peace. That is our hope this morning. Because you see, the conquering king is coming. He's returning, hopefully sooner than later. And when he comes, he will come with his sword and there will be justice done on the earth. Amen. But right now, there is still opportunity for anyone that would receive salvation. That's what Hosanna means this morning. It means salvation. Jesus came offering himself as the answer. He came offering himself as the cure to what our disease of sin entails. Jesus is our hope. And as we go into this Holy Week, I pray that you will remember the voices of these children. Because Jesus says that if anyone will come to him like one of these, they will be received into the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Amen. Let's give God one more big hand this morning. Kids, you did great. You can go with your teachers and we'll find your parents. We're going to sing one more song to the Lord. And then if you are new, whether new today or new over the last few months, or maybe you just haven't been here for a while, I want to invite you to join me down that hall on the right hand side. You can come now or you can come after this song, but please take a few minutes and just come. Let us get to know you a little bit. We'll have appetizers for you. And uh, we just want to tell you a little bit about the church. I hope you guys have an awesome week. We love you. We'll see you Friday night for Good Friday service. You unravel me with a melody. Surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies to all my fears. Come on, let's sing this together, all the adults, all the children. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Come on, I am a child of God. I am a child.
so 